Jesus Christ, His Son, and has given us all things freely in Christ. We are grateful to Thee, Lord, for the privileges that we are granted by this great supreme sacrifice that Jesus gave for us at Calvary. That it reconciled us back into fellowship and to favor with Thee that we might have this consolation of knowing that it's written, if ye abide in me and my words in you, you can ask what you will. And it shall be done unto you. Now we're grateful for this and pray that you'll give us faith to believe it with all that's in us. Now let us lay aside, Lord, every toil of the day, every care of this life, all the way from the janitor to the pastor, that there would be nothing in our minds now but be waiting, listening reverently for the Holy Spirit to speak to us. That we might accomplish something good to know more of Thee by our gathering together. For Lord, truly, that's why we come on this hot day. Speak to us through Thy living Word. And let the living Word Dwell in us and abide in us that we might be shaped and formed not to the world but be transformed by the renewing of our spirit into the form of the Son of God. Oh, our hearts tremble when we think in the joy floods our souls to know that we can be called sons and daughters of God. We stand on the very brim of His second coming and all nations and kingdoms quivering under our feet. All things of the world is vanishing, but knowing that someday He shall come and shall take us to a kingdom where there shall never be an end or it'll never be moved. And to think that we are now the, the subjects of that kingdom. Oh, God, circumcise our heart and ears today by the Holy Spirit through the washing of the water of the Word. For we ask it in His name and for His glory. Amen. I wish to approach the subject this morning for I was going to speak on something a little different if there was to be a healing service, but we announced that the prayer cards to be given out at 8 till 8.30 or 9 o'clock, and I just, Billy come up the house a few minutes ago and he said there was hardly anyone here. So... He didn't give out prayer cards. So we'll, I thought of taking this text for a correction of the church. Now I want to speak on the subject of a deceived church by the world. I wish to read some now out of the book of Judges, the 16th chapter, beginning with the 10th verse. And Deliah said unto Samson, Behold, thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherein thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If thou bind me fast with new ropes that never were occupied, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Delilah therefore took new ropes and bound him therewith and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And there was liars in wait abiding in the chamber, and he brake them from off his arms like as threads. And Delilah said unto Samson, Hitherto thou hast mocked me, 
and told me lies. Tell me where thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If thou weavest seven locks of my head with a web. And she fastened it to the pins and said unto him, The Philistines be on thee, Samson. And he awakened out of his sleep and went away with the pins of the beams and with the web. And she said unto him, How canst thou say I love thee? When in thine heart is not with me, thou hast mocked me these three times, and hast told me wherein thy great strength lies. And hast not told me wherein thy great strength lies. And it came to pass, when she had pressed him daily with her words and urged him, so that his soul was vexed unto death. And he told her all his heart and said unto her, There has not come a razor up on my head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like another man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he has shown me all his heart. And the lords of the Philistine came up unto her and sought money in her, brought money into her hand. And she made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man, and he caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head and began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wits not that the Lord had departed from him. Now I wish to read for a text for this subject found over in the book of Revelations, the second chapter, beginning with the 21st and the 23rd verses. And I gave her space to repent of her fornications, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her unto great tribulations, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. Samson, great deal like the church, started off right. He started off in the right direction. He started off and was called a mighty man of valor. He started out serving the Lord and keeping his words and doing his commandments. And that was somewhat like the church. It started off on, as we would say, as a world expression, started on the right foot. Started to keep the commandments of the Lord. And as long as Samson followed the Lord, the Lord used Samson. For God can keep anyone and use anyone that will follow after Him. For it's God's business. But when we turn to a side away from the things of God, then God cannot use us any longer. When we we'll walk steadfastly after the commandments of God, when we'll stay in the pages of the Bible and worship by the written word, 
Worship Him in the Spirit and in the truth of the Word. Then God can use any individual. But when they take a notion to turn aside after something else, then God cannot use that person any longer. So Samson makes a, a, a very outstanding representation of the church of today. When the church started, God could use the church. For the church walked diligently after the commandments of the Lord. Kept all of His judgments and His statutes. And done all of His commandments. And God was with the church. But it seems to be that there is such a weakening place amongst the church. Remember, we are not on a picnic, but we're in a battlefield. Many people just think that when they become a Christian, that that's all they need to do. That that settles it forever. If they are a Christian, then everything's going to come easy. Don't never get that in your head. For I become a Christian to fight. Fight the good fight of faith. I become a Christian to get in the battle lines. We are Christian soldiers. And we've got to be trained. And brought up and know all the techniques of the enemy to know how to fortify, to know how to, to fight the fight. And we can only do that as the Holy Spirit will reveal it to us. We cannot take what some other nation tells us when we go to war, some of their ideas, but we got to take our own ideas, the way the Holy Spirit would direct us and what ideas He would give us because He is the commanding chief of the army of the Christians. Samson did good. He was a great man until he began to begin to kind of we would call it Scallywag around until he began to get off of his own territory. And the church did run well and was all right until they began to get off of their territory. Samson began to flirt. And he was not flirting with Israel, that is girls. He began to flirt with a Philistine girls. And that's somewhat similar to what the church did. It never began to make love with its own. It got off after unbelievers. And begin to flirt with unbelievers. That's where we made our great and one of the greatest mistakes. That's when the church began to do things that wasn't right. It began to keep, like Samson, bad company. Samson, as long as he was in the company of the Lord's people, he did all right. But when he got to flirting with bad company, then he got in trouble. And that's the way it is with the church. When the church followed reverently and daily after the leading of the Holy Spirit, God bless them and miracles and signs and wonders followed the church. 
But when he began to keep bad company with the world, one of the worst things it done and the first things it done, it began to organize, breaking up fellowship amongst other believers because it found out that nations were organized. But this great gospel is not dedicated to one nation or one people. It's dedicated to whosoever will let him come. Amen. All nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. Praise God never did intend for us to draw boundary lines. Amen. But man wanted to be like they compare or to... A copy after. Go like the, the world does. Say the things that they do. Make a success. The way they were a success. We cannot never be a success doing anything the world does. We can only be a success as we follow after God's statutes and His way of doing things. We can never be by pattering after the world. If the cigarette company has met their greatest success by television and the beer and the whiskey crowds has made their great success through the contribution of television, that's no sign that the church shall make its success by television. Amen. The success of the church lies within the preaching of the gospel of the power of God and the demonstration of the Spirit. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. We cannot say because that television done such and such for the cigarette company and the, and the other companies. We do not have any scripture to try to compare with them people. And as long as we do, we may draw great numbers of people, but that's not what God ordained us to do. Amen. We think because that we're all colors, flying high, great organizations, causing great colorful things to take place, that it's a success. We are dying daily on our feet, oh, spiritually speaking. If we stood 10 million strong this morning and the Holy Spirit wasn't with us, we'd do well to stand 10 strong with the Holy Spirit with us. Amen. We cannot compare with the world. One of the first things was the church began to organize themselves. The first organization was the Catholic Church. And then come the Lutheran Church. When they organized in the Catholic Church to make it an organization, one day there was a cry. The Philistines is on me. Samson. And Samson broke the cords of the bounds of the Catholic Church and Martin Luther came forth. Amen. With the organizations. Then... They bound the church with another card, as Deliah did. And they began, instead of having God call man, man who were called by the Holy Spirit, maybe didn't know their ABCs. Amen. But they know Christ. Amen. Then the church got stylish and fashioned after the political speakers. And they had to give their preachers doctor's degree. Everybody had to be a doctor of divinity. That was another card to bind the church. Man go off and study. Each seminary tries to produce a better scholar so that their churches can brag, our pastor is a doctor of divinity. What did they do? One tried to have more knowledge than the other. Well, that doesn't mean anything in the sight of God. And there's no need for any man to try to take his worldly knowledge and ever please God with it. It's Amen. an abomination in the sight of God. Amen. 
You'll never please God with the worldly ambitions and knowledge because it's enmity to God, says the Scriptures. He cannot do it. And each one tries to have all the knowledge. They know just what to do and the words to say. And it becomes just a political speech and instead of a powerfully demonstrated Holy Spirit yeah. message that sinks to the heart of man Hallelujah. and discovers the sins. God. They're trained for political talks. And we don't need that. Amen. Paul said the word come to us not only of the gospel and word only, but to the power and the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. Amen. That brought the gospel. Demonstrating the powers of the Holy Ghost. But all these men go off to seminaries and they learn great educations, how they must stand before the people, how they must present themselves, how they must dress and how they must act. They should never use the wrong grammar. Now that's all right for a political speech. But we are not after the enchanting words of man. Paul said the gospel that I preached didn't come like that. Amen. But it come through the renewing of the, the Holy Ghost and the power of demonstrations. Amen. It doesn't Hallelujah. come Hallelujah. by a right form speech. God. That your wisdom would be or your trust would be in the wisdom of man. But it come through the demonstrations of the power of the risen Christ. Hallelujah. That's the gospel. Amen. To know Him in the power of His resurrection. God. Each one tries to think he's a little smarter than the other man. Each denomination, the Methodists will say, we got the smartest man. The Baptists will say, and the Church of Christ and so forth. They all, we, we're the smartest. We, our, our people, we don't let just the ordinary man go out and preach the gospel. But they handpick them. Oh, God have mercy. Handpick them. If they're indocumented with their certain doctrine, then they put them in the church. God can't touch him in no way. Amen. I want somebody to preach to me that's been handpicked by the Holy Ghost. God has raised up. Hallelujah. Not picked by man or denominations. Amen. All knowledge, they say, oh, we know all about it. And some of them doesn't know the first alphabet of the Holy Spirit. They deny it. It reminds me of a little book I read one day in California about ten years ago. I picked it up in an old bookstore. I forget who was the author. Just a little ten-cent book. But it had some good sense to it. Though it seemed jokingly and cunningly. But I found something in there that sounded like God to me. And one of the little stories started out like this. One morning in a great chicken pen, there was a certain little rooster that thought he had, had all the knowledge that there was to be known. So he flies up on a box and beat his little bill against the box four or five times threw back his little head and crowed like you never heard a rooster crow. And the others, he attracted their attention. And he said, Ladies and gentlemen of this chicken pen, I would like to speak to you all this morning on some great educational program we have just designed. said, I have required a lot of knowledge in my studying as he pulled his little glasses over his bill. And he said, I have decided that we chickens can better ourselves by a more knowledge. Therefore, I can tell you that if we will dig and work 
and a certain pen or a hole, we'll find a certain vitamin that'll make us crow better, prettier feathers. And oh, I can tell you how we can better ourselves in many different ways. And the little pullets with their little red combs, they just cackled and said, Isn't he a darling? And they certainly admired him. Oh, he is such a brilliant rooster. Reminds me of some of these here seminary preachers. Such a brilliant man. There's no need of us hanging around with the rest of the chickens. We all ought to go with him. Well, before the little fellow got his speech finished, there was another little chicken that didn't have such bright feathers. Come running in from the rest of the chicken yard and said, Boys, just a minute. I just heard the latest bulletin on the radio. Chickens went up four cents on the pound. We're all going to the slaughter tomorrow. What good your knowledge going to do? Brother, all the knowledge that we can accumulate, what good does it do? We're six foot of dirt. We're all dying by inches and by minutes. Our knowledge means nothing. We want to know Him. But they do that. As I was remarking some time ago about a certain little canary. And he thought he knowed all the knowledge that it needed to be known. And he knowed so much that he could tell all the rest of the canaries about the human beings. So he flies up on his cage and he begins to speak about the human beings. How he knowed all about them. And all of a sudden, a professor from Purdue walked up and began to speak some high, polished words to him. And the little fellow batted his eyes and turned his head. Now he had eyes, he could see the professor. He had ears, he could hear him. But of course he didn't know what he was talking about. Why? He's got a canary brain. He's just a bird brain. That's all he's got. He hasn't got a human brain. So he can't think like human beings. And neither can a human being think like God. You're human. All the worldly knowledge is no more than a canary brain. All you do, you just hurt yourself with it. You've got to have the mind of Christ. The reason people go and join organizations and substitute a handshake instead of the new birth, they're trying to bypass the new birth. They don't want the new birth. And they know we teach it in the Bible. So they want to substitute something for it. And the Pentecostal people are just as bad. Trying to substitute something. They want it in class. It must be just so classy. We'll shake hands and join the church and be sprinkled. Or baptized or something. They're afraid of the new birth. I sometimes believe the Branham Tabernacle is getting afraid of it. Now we all know... That a birth, I don't care where it is or whereabouts, it's a mess. If a baby's born on a shuck pile, on a hard floor, or in a peat decorated hospital room, it's a mess anyhow. A birth of a calf, birth of anything else, is a mess. And the new birth is nothing less than a mess. But people are so starchy. We'll go over where they shake hands. We'll go over where they don't bawl and cry and beat on the altar and cry out. You want to be too human. What we need is birth, dying out that brings forth life. Praise God. A seed, an old potato, a seed potato. You take that potato and put it in the ground until you can have new potatoes. That old potato has to rot. 
A corn cannot produce new life until it's rotten. And a man or a woman can never have new birth until their intellectuals and their own self is rotten, dead. Die out at the altar and scream. Get all messed up. To a place that starts gets out of your collar and you're born again by the Spirit of God. I don't care if you squall, speak in tongue, jump up and down, flop like a chicken with his head off. You're bringing forth new life. Amen. But we substituted something for it. Amen. We want the classical way. Praise God. Sure. The other day, Friday, wife and I was going to the store. I don't mean to harp on this. But as we went down the street, I just kept turning my head one way for the other. Naked women. I promised God when I was a blind man, if He'd heal my eyes, I'd look at the thing was right. I keep a little cross hanging in my car. When I see such as that, I look at the cross and say, Oh God, that's my refuge. As I looked at the cross... I seen those women. Meaty said, We haven't seen one woman today that's got on a skirt. And she said, Bill, look at that woman there. With those little straps around her top of her body. And said, You mean to tell me that woman don't know that's wrong? Said if she doesn't know it's wrong, then she's out of her right mind. I said, just a minute, honey. She is an American. She does as the Americans do. I said, I was in Finland not long ago, sweetheart. And I questioned there to a man that set me down. Dr. Munyanen. And we were going to the, the health baths. What's called the Sunda. And they take you in and Pour hot water on, uh, water on hot rocks and it just sweats you. Then they make you jump in ice water and then back out. Then you take you into a room and there's nurses and there are women who scrub the man and them naked. Send them back into the pool. I wouldn't go in. And I said, Dr. Money, and then that's wrong. Amen. He said, all right then, Reverend Brennan, that's wrong. Then how about your American doctors that'll strip a woman naked and lay her on the table and examine every sex organ she's got? Uh, how about your nurses in the hospitals? I said, excuse me, Brother Munyan, Munyan, you're right. What is it? It's customs. When I was in Paris, I could hardly believe it. That the urinals for both men and women were the same one. I couldn't understand it that the restrooms was on the side of the street for both male and female. I couldn't believe that when women went to the beach to go swimming, a boy and his sweetheart... They had no dressing rooms. They just took all their clothes to the last garment, then turned their backs and put on a little strap and went swimming, but it's so. They pay no attention to it. It's a custom of France. In Africa, women and men, young and old, no clothes at all, walking through the prairies, never know what a restroom was or things, or never went out of each other's sight. But they don't know the difference. They don't know the difference. But it's customs of nations. But I said, honey, we are different. We're from another nation. We are pilgrims and strangers here. That's what makes these things look so wrong. For the Bible said, they that profess such plainly show that they are Pilgrims and strangers, they are seeking a city to come. Amen. A man or a woman in Italy, in France, in Africa, in any other nation that's ever born again of the Holy Ghost, don't do those things. Amen. 
They won't wear those clothes. They won't act like that because they're of another nation whose ruler and maker is God. We're from heaven. The spirit that's within you motivates your life. If you are American, you'll do as the Americans do. If you are French, you'll do as the French do. And criticize the other. But if you are of God, you'll do the way they do in heaven. <laughs> because your spirit comes from above. And it controls you. A little something you might look at. In the scripture, those who sought this new city acted different. They professed that they were pilgrims and strangers. But on the side of Cain, they become fugitives and renegades. But Christians were pilgrims and strangers. A fugitive has no home. A renegade is a horrible person. But a pilgrim is something real and from a real land in another nation trying to find his way home. Professing by his living that he has something that he's from another country. There is the reason. But yet those people who do so, those people who wear those things, let me tell you, in South Africa, when I saw 30,000 thousand raw heathens, naked, blanket natives, 16, 18, 20-year-old girls, boys with not one stitch of clothes, standing there with mud in their faces and painted up, bones to their nose and blocks of wood hanging from their ears and cross human bones or some bones in their hair, animals' teeth hanging over them. Naked as they come into the world. And didn't know it. But when they received Christ and fell on their face and received the Holy Ghost, they got up and folded their arms to hold shame to their bosom as they walked away and found clothes to put on. Amen. Why? They become pilgrims and strangers to this world. Amen. Hallelujah. They were away from him. Yes, sir. Oh, yes. These people call themselves Christians. They belong to churches. They go and say, we are Methodists. We're Baptists. We're Pentecostal. We're Seventh-day Adventists. We're this, that, and the other. That doesn't have one thing to do with it. Your spirit, the life that's in you, motivates and tells what you are. Amen. Jesus said, by their fruit you shall know them. The church has become like Israel first. They seen all the heathen nations having a king. God was their king. And they seen the heathen nations having king. So they wanted to act like the heathen nations and they bought themselves a king. And as they did it, they got in trouble. Gradually it began to come in. Gradually the world began to slip into them. Finally ended up in Ahab. One king coming just a little closer to it, a little closer to it, and finally squeezed the life out of him. There they went, and when their real king come, they didn't know him. That's the same thing the church has done. It's adopted. Here you are. It's adopted politics, educations. It's adopted organizations, society, big churches. Hot concluding preachers. And when the real king comes, they don't know him. And they're crucifying the very Holy Ghost that's their king. They don't know him. Hallelujah. But they laugh at him and make fun of him as the Jews did their Messiah. The church is doing their Messiah the same way. They don't know it. They haven't got the spiritual insight. Because they're so indocumented with their eyes and what they see. Great buildings trying to compare with the world. Amen. We're never exalt, exalted to, to compare with the world. We're exalted to humble ourselves. And one is 
is the majority in God. And today in the healing evangelists out on the fields, there's such a competitive competitors. One says, well, bless God, I have so many thousands. I got a bigger meeting than you have. What difference does that make? If we have one or one million, what difference does it make? Are we true to God? Are we true to His Word? Do we stand under test of the Holy Spirit? Is it true? That's the main thing. But we compromise upon the Bible. A lot of our Pentecostal people upon the fundamental doctrines of this Bible compromise. I don't want to hurt feelings. I'm in my own church. Now I feel that I, sh- I could do just what in my church because I'm preaching the gospel. But there's tens of thousands of Pentecostal preachers know that there's no such a thing in the Bible as a baptism in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. I challenge the archbishop or anybody to show me where anybody was ever baptized in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. But they compromise because these organizations has did so. There's not one person in the New Testament and for 300 years afterwards but history of what was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. What is it? Organization. That's did it. Compromising. And today they've took all the street workers off the streets. They've took the tambourine out of the church. They've taken all the glory out of the church. And got seminaries preaching little old rooster comb preaching. All polished in society and their women wearing shorts and dresses that they're skinned into and men smoking cigarettes and gambling and telling dirty jokes. It's a disgrace in the sight of God. I know that's rough, but it's time somebody said something. Compromising. Giving in, acting like the world. I don't care if I have to stand alone with nobody but God alone. I'll preach the truth of God's Bible and stand for it. If I die, I'll still stand for the truth. Praise the Lord. Certainly, we want truth. I'll measure up not according to the church, but according to the Word of God I want to measure up. But Delia, did you notice? She knew that Samson had a power. And she didn't know where that power laid. She couldn't tell what that power was. But there was some great power that Samson possessed. And she wanted to find it. And as Deliah, she kept wooing Samson after her beauty. Oh, she dressed herself real sexy and she walked before him and she tee-heed like some of the little teenagers of the day and, and so forth. And would just act like something other, a strip tease. Trying to woo Samson to her. That's the same thing the world's done to the church. Uh, Now where is your great power? Well, if we'll organize, that'll break the power. The Catholic Church done it. But the Philistines is on these Samson and a Luther come out. And he organized again. If you'll buy me with another card, it'll hold me. So they did. And the Philistines on these Samson, what happened? Wesley came out and broke the cards. Amen. Now you've deceived me all along. Don't you know I love you, Samson? All right, tell me the truth in your heart. All right, you buy me with another card. All right, now we'll do that. What is that? That's the denominational card. You let me be free and I ain't got no denomination. Then I'll tell you you have me broke. So how come the Pentecostals? Amen. Where's your power? Philistines be upon me and he broke the cards. Again. But now what happened? It's got the Pentecostals. The big doctors of divinity for their pastors. Some great man. They've got just as much school and ritual as the Methodists or Baptists or any of the rest of them's got. Go into a church and you can't hear an amen. Just as cold as a bunch of uh, Eskimos right off the North Pole. Amen. Cold. Indifferent. And now the Philistines is on the Samson. The Philistines is on the America. Where is that oneness of spirit? Amen. 
Where is the oneness of Pentecost? The assemblies of God and the united in the church of God and this, that, and the other. Each one with a different is and this one with that and this one with that. We're so broke up to, you can go into a city to hold a revival of one church sponsored, the rest of them won't even attend. Amen. The communist is up on the America. Where is our power? Where's our glory? What is it? Because we went after the wisdom of man instead of the power of God. While we've got our preachers and things that are so stiff and starchy till they've organized us till we're so starchy and stiff-necked till people, do you ever hear a shout in the church anymore? You never hear anybody cry. The mourner's bitch is put in the basement. There's no more glory in the church. All we do is set back just as stiff as we can be. We're not free. We're bound. The devil with his modernistic Demons has bound the church of the living God. That's right. There's no more power in the church. There's no more freedom. The people are so starchy and stiff. While the God can come into the midst of Pentecostal people and show that He's God and prove His signs of His resurrection and don't even shake them. Glory. Why, it's a disgrace. I walk across the country, God working, performing signs, and people sitting. Well, I guess that's all right. Oh, I know it can be done. It doesn't move them. Why? They're bound with the lie of the world. They're in fetters. Now I've even got them into, bound them into a confederation. The Philistines are on these, Samson. What you going to do about it? Oh, we've got great denominations, sure. We have greater membership than we ever had. But where's the Spirit? Where's the Holy Ghost? That's what the devil has done. It's wooed into the church. It's kept wooing the church. Come to me. I'll give you a great big tabernacle over here if you'll just do this. If you'll get rid of that fanatic preacher you got and get a man, a doctor, divinity, has got some sense, we'll build a nice big classical church and we'll be like the rest of them. Shame on you. Rather have a man that didn't know uh, split coffee from beans, but was filled with the Holy Ghost. That was uncompromised by the power of God. But it's got us so starchy that some poor saint can break through in the meeting and speak in tongues or shout a little bit or do something and the rest of them will all gander around and look. What was that? Well, I wonder why oh, that must be a fanatic dropped in somewhere. Yes, amen. Thank God. You know that's the truth. Amen. Some poor saint step in, get happy enough to raise her hands and cry and praise the Lord. Somebody who will holler amen to the preaching of the gospel. And the rest of them turn around and see what he said. That's Pentecostal. Uh, Lord, help. What's the matter? Your pattern after the Methodist, after the Baptist. They pattern after the Catholic. Catholic pattern after hell. Amen. And all together is all after hell. Yes. Amen. Right. The liar has wooed you into big churches. Fine educated ministers. Take the better class. Well, you know, so-and-so down here is a millionaire. If we could just get him to come into our congregation, oh my. If he isn't born again, then he doesn't deserve to be there. Amen. I don't care if he's got a million dollars. If he owns 40 Cadillacs, whatever he's got, he's got to be born again. Come right down to a new birth and be regenerated by the Holy Ghost. And come out of there in a new birth, snotting, excuse me, of crying and screaming and carrying all like the rest of them. And live a life afterwards to prove he's got it. Amen. Amen. That's what you need. Samson... The Philistines is up on thee. The communists is up on thee. The world's up on thee. The devil's up on thee. They go back and they see the Spirit of God perform miracles and do things of His resurrection, what Jesus promised. They say, you know, I think Brother Bram's got a lot of mental telepathy. <laughs> My pastor said it was of the devil. You poor, hypocritical, deluded infidel. All polished up. You... Wolf in sheep's clothes. Jesus said, if you'd have known me, you'd have known my day. 
But you've got a bunch of souls that try to make you like the rest of the world. We want a bunch of men of God who don't compromise on the Word, but preach the truth and stand on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But what has the world done? It's shaved all your power off. You were born Nazarite, Pentecost, but the world certainly shaved your power. Now it's just as starch as the rest of them. What are we going to do? What's going to happen? There's one glorious thing that I can think of in this text. While Samson was bound, we can't have a revival. Listen to our loyal brother Billy Graham. Revive in our day. Listen to Oral Roberts scream. Revive in our day. Listen to the rest of them. Revive in our day. How can we have a revival when we're bound? Amen. We bound the Holy Spirit with our organizations and traditions, and we can't have a Holy Ghost revival. Amen. Man, I know that's scorching hot with the weather, but it's the truth. How can we have a Holy Ghost revival when you're so bound and starchy? Farm of godliness, the Bible said they'd have. Farm of godliness, but would deny the power thereof. The power of what? The power of the organization, the power of the world, the power of the church, the power of the Holy Ghost. That's the secret place in the church. And when the church adopts educated preachers and big buildings and finery and instead of the old-fashioned Holy Ghost, it better be in a mission again. Amen. 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 How are you going to have a revival of the Holy Ghost and people quench it and bound it and are afraid of it? <laughs> There's where the trouble lies. The Philistines is on me. But the one blessed hope we have, while Samson was in jail, what's the first thing they'd done when they caught him? They bound him first. They took his power away. They found his secret. They found your secret. The world found your secret. Now, you women all bob your hair. It goes like the world. You men all go and act like the world. It's all right. Tell jokes and dirty jokes and go out and smoke a few cigarettes and run out with the neighbor's wives and everything else like that. A little sociable drink to hold your job. I'd rather lay on my belly and eat soda crackers and drink branch water and stay clean and pure before God than to compromise for any kind of a job. Right. True. Stay true to God. Samson, the Philistines is on thee. Branham Tabernacle, worldlyism is creeping in among you. What about it? Have you exposed your secret? Have you exposed that secret? Did God give you when you were wallowing there in the sawdust a few years ago? Have you let it creep out the social formal worship? What's happened to you? God can come down and perform a miracle and go right down to the audience and tell people the secrets of their hearts and everything and heal the sick and afflicted and do signs and wonders and preach His Word as hard as He can by the Holy Ghost. And people say, well, I guess that's all right. We enjoy listening to it once in a while. We're not too tired. That's Branham Tabernacle. The Philistines is on thee. What used to be when the preaching of the Word and the old... Saints with the tears in their eyes would rise to their feet and walk sobbing. Maybe not saying a word, just walking around two or three times and sit down. So fill with the Holy Ghost, the Word fed them. Amen. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Uh, no. Philistines is on thee, Branham Tabernacle. Philistines is on you, Pentecostal. Of course, the Philistines got you, rest of you. Long time ago when you organized yourself so tight. Nothing could come in unless you was a Presbyterian, Baptist, Methodist, Catholic or something. You wouldn't have nothing to do with the rest of them. So revival in our day, how can we have it? When the regular reviver giver is bound by the world. God won't come in where the world is. You can just depend on that. You associate with the world, then it's, it's all of it. When you let the world creep in, you go to act and act the world, then you are finished. But when you'll cut loose every fetter from the world and come to God, God will use you until you go to flirting again. Here's the only hope that I have this morning to wind up my message is this. While Samson was bound, a new shock of hair grew out. God 
send us another church just before the end time that the power of the Holy Ghost can come into her in the demonstrations of the Spirit in Mark 16 can follow the church. Acts 2 and 4, Acts 2, 38, all of it will be following right along with the church. Signs and wonders accompany the apostles. Great signs of His resurrection.